All right. Well, welcome. We're going to get started here with the synthetic aperture radar session. I wasn't, this is the first time that I'm teaching this, and I wasn't actually quite sure how much interest there was going to be. So I was pleasantly surprised that during the survey that there was uh, so much interest in this data set. Uh, and we do see a lot of use of it uh, within uh, the different data sets that are in the Earth Engine pa uh, public data catalog. So what I am going to do today is uh, base most of this off of a presentation that will have links to some hands-on materials. Uh, so it'd be best if you, if you want to follow along or you're not sure if you want to follow along, it would be good to uh, get on your computer to, to have the same presentation that I have right here. And in order to get to this, uh, you'll probably get used to this throughout uh, geo for good But if you go back to the main link for geo for good the g.co slash earth slash geo for good 19 and then click up here on the agenda breakout sessions. And then finally, if you scroll down in the breakout sessions, there's going to be a section in there that says synthetic aperture radar. And at the bottom of that, there's this slide deck, which is what I am showing right there. So just so I don't confuse myself, I'm going to get rid of my second copy of there. But uh, so that's the main slide deck that we're going to be going through. It has links to, as I said, some hands on uh, work that we're going to do as we go along. And it also has links to other materials that you might want to come back to after this session is, is done. All right. So this is a two chili pepper session, which means that we are going to be going rather fast on some of the basic concepts of Earth Engine. So I'm going to assume that you do know about collections, mapping across collections, that you've played a little bit around with the user interface uh, aspects of the code editor with Earth Engine. Um, if there is something that's really confusing, though, do please raise your hand. There's some TAs that are around here that will be able to either help you get caught up or answer a question or stop me if I've done something that is a little bit too confusing. Uh, but with that, let's uh, get, get moving on. All right, so by the end of this, exception, this session, there's a few things that I would expect that you will have. Uh, and one is just a basic understanding of radar and SAR theory, if you don't already. It's not going to be really deep. We don't have, you know, we have an hour to get through all of this in here. So it's going to be uh, some of the major concepts of, of radar and SAR. Uh, some hands-on experience exploring a particular uh, SAR data set, which is the Sentinel-1 GRDE data set that we have available in Earth Engine. And then we're going to have some experience exploring a SAR analysis, uh, a particular type of analysis of anomaly detection. Realize that there's all kinds of things that you might want to do with SAR, but I tried to get something that was uh, general that could at least show you how to work with the data set and some of the analysis tools that are available in Earth Engine. And then finally, links to where you might go on to go in the future to look continuing, to continue learning more about SAR. All right, so starting off with the theory, what we're going to go over first is start with radar and finally build up to what this synthetic aperture radar thing is. So radar itself is generally a portion of the electromagnetic spectrum that uh, energy is transmitted in. Uh, it basically fits in wavelengths that are sort of about this big. They might be that big. They might be this big, but on the order of this, this large. Uh, in the radio frequency or the radio wave uh, section of the electromagnetic spectrum. So where cell phones operate as well. Uh, most things are measured in centimeters uh, in terms of the waves that we'll be working with in radar. There are many different classes of these radar wavelength bands. Uh, P, L, S, C, and X are up here. The one that we're going to be playing with uh, today is C band. When you get down to the C and X bands, like to the lower part of this list here, they're pretty sensitive to forest canopy. So they're not really, they're not penetrating always when you have dense uh, foliage. There are other uh, sensors like PALSAR in the L band or the upcoming NISAR that are relatively insensitive to forest canopy because they have a much longer wavelength and they will give you more information about what's going on in the ground. So it's important to know that all radar is not created equal. It has these different wavelengths, and it will give you back different information based on the, the wavelengths that, are, that it's transmitting and receiving. 
Uh, so radar itself uh, is, stands for radar detection and ranging. It's normally just known as radar. No, there, it's not too often people go all the way back to the acronym anymore. But the idea behind this is that there is an antenna that emits some energy and it goes off and then it will bounce off some scatterer. Some of that energy will make it back to the source, some will not, some of it will go off in other directions. That's pretty easy to understand when you have just a single scatterer, but in most cases you will have uh, multiple scatterers, even for a, a radar that's oriented in this way. But if you have a radar that's pointing down at the Earth, then there's all kinds of things that could be reflecting uh, energy back. So it's a little bit, uh, sometimes a little bit confusing to understand exactly how it's coming back. These, uh, what is transmitted is gonna be a, a pulse or a chirp that comes out of the antenna. And it's, so it's not just all in one instant of time, but it might have a waveform. And the, when it comes back, the timing of the waveform and how it's been distorted or modified when it comes back gives you information about what is out there. Um, but this is the, the main gist of radar. It's an active um, sensing platform. So it's compared to something like Landsat or Sentinel, these optical imageries. Uh, this one has its own energy source for transmitting back. Uh, transmitting energy out. Uh, so it, the nice part about that is that it works at night. You can, you're not reliant on the sun. Uh, but the downside of that is that they're more complex and energy hungry kind of instruments to maintain in space. Uh, so, because you actually have to generate and store, you have to generate uh, the signal and you, it takes some energy to do so. Uh, there is the concept of what's known as imaging radar, when you have something that's in an aerial platform, whether that's an uh, airplane or a satellite, and that generally be looking down off to the side as the uh, platform is moving along, and it's looking for reflections that are coming back. And because that it's, it's looking down at an angle to the side, that will give you a shorter timing to things that are closer to you and a longer timing in terms of response time to things that are farther away. And because it's moving, you'll get even more information uh, about what's happening uh, as you move past an object. There are different uh, mechanisms that uh, will scatter the information back. Here are just some examples of that. Uh, something that is uh, a forward scattering, like a flat surface, like flat water, uh, when there's no wind, uh, will not reflect much at all back to uh, the satellite. So you'll notice that when we're looking at the back scatter and trying to interpret it, water tends to be dark unless there are waves on top of it, and then it might, be, that might have more. Um, the second image over here is showing that if there is some waves, you might get some scattering because of the angle of the waves might reflect some of the, the signal back towards the source. Uh, you also get the same thing on a, a train objects. If it, the angle of the train is facing the satellite sensor, you're going to get a bright return, a relatively bright return. And if it's actually uh, facing away, you might not get any return at all, or it might be in the shadow of what the uh, sensor can see. Uh, there is the concept of multiple bounces. It might be, in this case, it's illustrating a double bounce type of behavior that you might see in a forested area, but there's all kinds of other complex uh, bouncing that might occur within a canopy or within something that's semi-permeable like snow or ice. Uh, it'll have different return types as well. When you move to urban areas, there'll be a lot of really strong reflectors because there tend to be a lot of right angles uh, when you go into urban areas. And that makes it so that you get a double bounce with most of the energy going directly back to the source, um, or potentially going back to the source, especially if you have like a corner reflector with three different uh, sides together. These, those can be very bright returns. And that's how they actually, that's one of the things that they use to calibrate uh, radars is that they'll put these uh, corner reflectors out in like a field and you can see them very well uh, in the radar signal. Uh, in addition to this idea of transmit and getting back, you know, some portion of what was transmitted, there's also the concept of uh, polarization of the waves that are being transmitted. So you can have things that are vertically oriented or horizontally oriented by the antenna, and then the response might be, once again, vertically oriented or horizontally uh, 
oriented. And the reason that's important is some of the things that you're looking at will scat when they scatter the energy, they might actually change the orientation of the electric wave. And that can give you valuable information for classification. Um, and also the ratio of energy that is between, that is changed in orientation, like for example, went from vertical to horizontal, is also can be quite valuable for interpreting uh, what you're looking at. Uh, the aperture itself uh, generally is controlled by this antenna, and antennas can be designed so that they will be, uh, you know, a wide amount of information in one dimension and maybe narrow in the other direction. In this case, if you have something, a radar that's on the ground, you're probably, it, this antenna looks like it's probably looking for stuff that's sort of near the ground rather than worrying about what's up in the, uh, up in the air. So you basically can, uh, focus both where the signal goes out and where you're sensitive to receiving with different types of uh, aperture design. You don't really have a lot of control over these physical apertures when you're on a satellite. I mean, there's not a lot you can do and you don't wanna put like a really uh, large thing on top of a satellite that, that might, um, uh, might not last, <laughs> I guess, that long or be kind of uh, unstable and vibrate potentially. Uh, but there is the idea of the synthetic aperture, and that means that you can take an advantage of the fact that the antenna is moving uh, along, you know, basically usually uh, perpendicular to whatever you're looking at. And because of that movement and a lot of math, you can actually simulate a larger aperture that will give you more sensitivity about what you're looking at. And that will give you the ability to have higher resolution images on the ground from the fact that this, this uh, platform is moving. So the radars that you generally see on aircraft and satellite will be known as these synthetic aperture radars, and they just mean that they're taking advantage of the movement in terms of processing and forming images. There's another technique, too, that is doing repeat passes of a similar radar, and you do what's known as interfer interferometry, or uh, interferometry, which is comparing two passes and the phase differences between them. And so exam this example here might be that you had satellite that looked uh, with radar on a certain part of the Earth and then it did its uh, orbits and then it came back sometime later, you know, six days, 12 days later. And then you look at the differences because a lot of the stuff on the ground probably didn't move, so you can get uh, measurements that line up the phase of those areas that are assumed to have not moved. And then you can look for other areas that had a difference. And that might be from deformation due to earthquakes. It might be land subsidence. Uh, there's all kinds of different things that might account for this move movement. But uh, those things pop out when you actually look at these, these uh, phase differences between the repeat passes. And that's known as INSAR. We're not going to do INSAR in Earth Engine. I'm not going to be describing that here. It's, it uses a data type of complex numbers, which is not one of the things we natively support in Earth Engine right now. So I just wanted to mention that in here, but unfortunately, we're not going to have any examples of that. All right, there's a lot of good tutorials out there. Uh, SAR is actually something that is complex, and I would say there's not really that many groups around the world that are real experts in doing it. Uh, but the ones that are have made some really good tutorials uh, to put in line or put online to describe some of the you know the basic concepts of it. Uh, sometimes tied into particular sensors. So Natural Resources Canada has a good uh, website up there on microwave remote sensing. Uh, this one I really liked here is the Layman's Interpretation Guide to L-Band and C-Band Synthetic Aperture Radar. So a very long title, but it actually has a lot of good images, and I, I use some of those in the introduction slide, some of the, some of the graphics from there. Uh, this comes from the um, CEOS group and GeoFi. And then finally, this was mentioned earlier this morning during the keynote, but there's the SAR handbook that was uh, put out, and that describes uh, for the idea of doing uh, force monitoring some particular analyses and particular sensors that are very applicable to that. Uh, this one had some really good uh, images in there, I think, of the different band combinations that you might want to use for constructing um, land classification based on uh, SAR imagery. All right, so next step that we're going to do is a little bit of hands-on. It's not going to be so much an analysis. It's going to be more an exploration of the Sentinel-1 GRD data. So just highlight some of the, the major um, pieces that are, are particular to this particular uh, data set. So 
one of the main resources for Sentinel One itself is ESA, who is the is the agency or, uh, that is responsible for Sentinel One. They have a really comprehensive user guide describing about the different um, channels you know uh, that are used here, the different acquisition modes, etc. A lot of the stuff that we're going to be showing here is kind of cutting up the different aspects of that are shown in the Sentinel One uh, user guide. Uh, within the Earth Engine docs, we have two places where Sentinel One is described. One is the data set description page in the data catalog. This is similar to like all of the other large collections that we have in Earth Engine. There's the Sentinel One SAR GRD data set. Uh, but then because Sentinel One is quite different than the other optical uh, data sets that we have in there, we also have a page that uh, describes the Sentinel One algorithms in some detail. All right, so if you're following along, I invite you to click on this link within the code editor here. And what this is going to bring up for you, I'm going to have to probably zoom around a little bit in here and try to get my, get it so it looks somewhat reasonable on the screen here. Okay. All right, so what I have here is San Francisco area, which you see in the center here of the screen. And on the left side, there's optical imagery from the Sentinel-2 satellite. On the right-hand side, it's from the Sentinel-1 GRD data set here. And what this is is a split window pane, so you can drag back and forth the slider if you want to see differences between there. Uh, this is also just a code editor script, so if you're really curious about what's going on behind the scene, you can draw down from the top and look at uh, the code. And for this example, I'm going to step through some of it. Some of the later ones I won't do as much there. Uh, but just starting off and looking around at uh, what we see in the Sentinel-1 data here. One thing that's quite obvious here is it looks a lot better underneath the clouds with radar than it does with optical. That's very useful in areas that are perpetually cloudy. San Francisco is one that's pretty famous for its clouds or its fog rolling in, which covers uh, this part quite often. Uh, but with this type of SAR imagery, you can get in at least a starting understanding about uh, what's going on underneath. So this might be very useful for looking at deforestation in areas that are perpetually cloudy, uh, is giving you at least one signal that is, uh, could be useful here. Uh, the other thing that we can see in here are these really bright lobes in the SAR imagery out in the bay. And these most likely are the really large container ships that come into San Francisco and just park there while they're waiting to be unloaded or waiting for their, their next trip. Um, what these will do when they have a really strong uh, reflective pattern is that you'll actually see these crosshairs form, these artifacts in there. Uh, and that gives you some indication of what the orientation was of the of the signal or the satellite as it was uh, passing and observing. Uh, other things you can notice here is that the water is dark relative to the land, but it's not uniformly dark. I mean, there is some sensitivity. Um, be, I would guess that this is, has to do with wave conditions, but can't really tell from here as well. Uh, and then finally, if we zoom out a little bit uh, further, I'll give you kind of an idea of like what a SAR path looks like relative to one of the Sentinel ones, just the dimensions. I mean, they're somewhat comparable to like uh, the dimensions of, of Landsat or Sentinel-2 uh, as they're coming along. All right, I'm going to go briefly then through a little bit of what is being used to uh, show off the Sentinel data and compare it to others up here. And uh, there's a few things that are going on here. I'm basically defining a starting date and ending date, looking at a 10-day period here. And then also, once I have that start and end date uh, defined, then building up a date filter that can be used later to apply to both the optical and the uh, SAR data set. So that's my date filter here at the top. And then down a little bit farther here, I have some configuration for the optical data that's shown on the left. So the first line here is like, what are we going to call it? We'll call it optical imagery from Copernicus Sentinel-2. The next line here is going to be a definition, or basically it's going to uh, reference the entire Copernicus 
Sentinel-2 data set and then filter by that date filter that was defined earlier. And then finally, just display whatever bands, um, you know, the, a band combination that looks like it's a true color representation uh, over on the left side. Uh, so that's what you see down here at the bottom if I move back to where there's a little bit land. Uh, that type of uh, image. And then correspondingly on the left-hand side, it's, it's, it's similar, but a little bit more complicated. You know, we start off with labeling it as the backscatter. But then when we get to the point of working with the Sentinel-2 image collection, the collection itself has all kinds of different types of images in it because the uh, Sentinel-2 instrument Will, or sorry, Sentinel-1 instrument will change uh, in terms of modes. It might have different uh, transmitting in the vertical or the horizontal at different times. The receiving, similarly, it has instrument modes uh, that um, we'll talk about a little bit later, but that's something that you have to filter because images from different modes are all in the same collection. And then finally, it's important to know whether it was ascending or descending because the, the uh, orientation or, or the relative position of the satellite is going to be different depending on whether it was going north or it was going south as it's crossing there. Uh, so all of those things I'm filtering on the collection here uh, before I pass it down basically to the map. And then also we have a series of bands that we can select from. In this case, I'm choosing the VV band, which was the vertical polarization for transmit and then also receive. And the, the units for that are in logarithms of decibels, or uh, there's a logarithm in there at least. Uh, and it will be very small numbers, generally uh, negative 25 to five, sometimes it goes up to zero. But they, it's not surprising that they're negative numbers because they're pretty, they're pretty small values of energy that's being returned. Uh, then finally down here, uh, each of these examples that I have are using what's known as a split map, uh, user interface in, in Earth Engine. So I'm going to configure one map for the left side right here, another map for the right side there, add some labels, and then link them together so that when I move one, lap, one, move one map, it moves the other map. And then finally, uh, you know, add that split panel to the page and center it on a location that's of interest. So that's our basic script that we'll be going through for a lot of the other examples as well. So any questions that we have at this point before we go through a bunch of other variations of this? All righty. So going back to the presentation here, the next thing that we're going to talk about is the ascending and descending orbits. And as I mentioned before, it's important to know because the data that you get back depends on where the satellite was because the satellite is looking off at an angle. The angle varies from, I believe, around 15 degrees to about 45 degrees off to the side. Um, and so the incidence also of the energy on the ground is changing across the, um, across the image that you're looking at. All right, so what we have here is on the left-hand side, what's known as an ascending orbit and a descending orbit on the right-hand side. It looks sort of like a V. They cross there on this particular date. But if I zoom out far enough, um, actually, just to verify, I want to make sure that I'm, yep, I'm looking at one day's worth of, I'm advancing one day for the end date. So this is going to be how much uh, data was collected you know, for this portion of the world in one day for this very particular mode and see what else filters I had in there. So a particular instrument mode, and then also if it had that VV polarization. So it might have been acquiring other data at that time, but you don't know from this query right here. Uh, what's kind of neat about this is that if you can ex uh, change that to look at like what the angles are, and I'm going to do that for both of these, both sides here. So I'm going to either side of my split map and turning on the angles. And what that allows you to see is that, uh, so high values or high angles are in bright. So that means that it's, it's going to be you know, a high angle off to the, the side versus a low one. I think I have that right. <laughs> I have to actually look and see how it was defined in the angle there. Uh, but it varies as you go from one side to the other. 
if I, uh, the repeat uh, of the Sentinel-1 uh, satellite is 12 days, but there's now two of them up in orbit. So if I do six days, I should start getting quite a bit better coverage around here, assuming that there was uh, adequate, um, you know, it was acquiring in these particular uh, mode that I'm looking for right now. So let's see how that looks. A little far out there. All right, so this is gonna be how much coverage you get in six days using both of the Sentinel-1 platforms, Sentinel-1A and 1B. And so it looks, there's kind of an interesting pattern here. If I move over, slider over here, it's showing that for, you know, the greater part of Eastern Canada and the United States, you're not really getting any information from the descending orbit in that particular mode uh, because they are changing the modes. And uh, you'll be able to see a little bit of that pattern later on. Uh, but doing something like this is really useful to figuring out whether there will even be a hope of getting uh, the Sentinel information uh, with the parameters that you want for your area of interest. All right, so that was ascending and descending. Let me go back to presentation, and we'll skip ahead now to just a slide describing the Sentinel pro One product modes. So there are a few different modes that the the Sentinel One uh, will acquire in. The ones that are more most um, often acquired in is the uh, interact interferometric wide swath mode and then the extra wide swath mode. Uh, I don't think I even found in there the, the wave mode one. That, I guess that's another mode that the <laughs> SAR can acquire in, but it looks like that's going to be pretty patchy, and I didn't actually see any in our Sentinel-1 collection right now. Uh, and then finally, there is a, a strip map mode as well. Uh, they differ in terms of both the resolution, kind of the, the angle and, and area that they cover as they pass around. Uh, and I've noted that a lot of uh, it changes depending on the latitude that you're at, uh, which mode they're going to be in. So this next uh, script here, if you click on that, is going to explore a little bit about two of the most popular modes, the interferometric wide swath mode and the extra wide swath mode, so IW and EW. And if I zoom out a little bit here to get you know, Canada represented, uh, what you'll note is that a lot of the EW mode happens when you're over the Arctic. And correspondingly, it switches at some point modes to be in this IW, interferometric wide swath mode, as you get over at least the western U.S. And in between, there's some period of time where it doesn't acquire anything. So it's shutting off, changing modes, seems like for a period of time. Uh, and that means that there's some areas here that you don't seem to get as much information. Granted, this is only for one window of, I can't remember whether I was doing six days for this one or not. Yep, six days. Um, so it can vary. Uh, another kind of interesting to, thing to look at, too, is that as you go over into Europe, where... ESA, the European Space Agency, is located, and who is paying for the satellite. <laughs> There's really good acquisitions over there. <laughs> they do a great job of covering Europe, but that's to be expected. Um, they also tend to turn on the instrument just when it's going over land and then turn off, uh, presumably for saving parts of the instrument, whether it's power or uh, other components. All right, so those are the, the two major modes that you find most of the time uh, for a certain polarization, I believe, and a certain boo, 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 certain polarization, and then in a certain uh, instrument mode. Oh, sorry, those are the two instrument modes, but also for a descending orbit. Got so many of these uh, properties, I have to remember which one I'm varying for each of these examples there. All right, the next one that I have here, going on this same pattern, is uh, now tarting, starting to look at the polymetry, polarimetry of the, the data. Uh, and as I said before, the channels are named by the orientation of the antenna and that's transmitting and receiving. So VH is vertical transmit, horizontal receive polarization, et cetera. And if I go into this example here with uh, showing the code here, or not showing the code yet, just examining the data, 
you know, swipe back and forth here. Uh, one thing that you'll see is like, you know, from here is the VV polarization. So it's not changing polarizations as it's being reflected. It tends to be brighter, especially over the urban areas, but also over the water areas. Uh, and also it has more of those artifacts, artifacts from the reflection here. Um, and then when you, but it, it also appears, and this is more uh, not borne out by any analysis, but it's a lot cleaner potentially to work at identifying stuff with the VH polarization. That being said, I didn't adjust, the, I'm using the exact same min and max for both of these views. So you might um, want to adjust those in order to see what type of information you can get out. Uh, actually, I have to verify that I'm actually using the same polarization, yep, or same uh, visualization parameters, negative 25 to 5, so yes, for both of those. But this, um, both looking at these polarizations and the ratio of these polarizations can give you information about what it is you're looking at. Um, for one place that's interesting, well, actually any place that it has a lot of agriculture is going to be potentially pretty interesting here. I'm going to go over to the Central Valley and just zoom into some of the areas where you have some prominent farm fields. And then here you'll see it's not just darker than the others. You get different kind of contrasts, and that's going to be probably dependent on what is growing there and what state it's in. All right. So at this point, uh, we've gone through a bunch of the, the different aspects or the properties of the Sentinel-1 data set uh, and give you an idea of how, they're, how it's distributed around the Earth. There's probably a lot more exploring that you'd want to do if you're thinking of using this type of data set for your own area of interest. Uh, but one thing that's very useful I've found when you're exploring uh, around with the Sentinel data is producing these time series videos of just seeing how things change. And one of the nice things about the Sentinel-1 or radar data in general is that because it can see through the clouds, you don't have to do a lot of those steps that you have to do when you're making um, optical um, time series videos. So I just put together a script here that we can uh, experiment around with a little bit, uh, showing how that you would clip out an area. Um, basically, I have a little preview image here right now, and then be able to generate a thumbnail, which is going to be a video of a collection, image collection that's spread out over time uh, of the Sentinel-1 imagery. So just going briefly through the scripts here, uh, we have once again a time, an end date, and a start date. I'm looking at a window right now of 300 days. I wanted to make it so my collection eventually that I got to was under 40 images because I think that is our current limit right now for when you're producing uh, one of these videos uh, using the Git Thumb URL. Let me pause here a little bit while we get the... All right, so here's the end result before I go through too much through the code here. And this is uh, a glacier that's in the northwestern part of Greenland that's slowly advancing. So if you look closely at the bottom right of the screen, you can actually see the bright areas where there are cracks in the glacier starting to advance towards the sea. You see a little bit of the area breaking up in terms of the ice. Uh, I did this at one point again uh, in, at the South Pole when there was that really large ice island that uh, broke off. Uh, and that comes up really well in the Sentinel data as well. So the script itself in order to generate something like this is that you set a start date and end date for that will constrain your uh, image, imagery. And then I was filtering images that uh, interacted with a particular point that I had, this geometry, which is a point, and then I buffer it by a certain radius. So this looks like uh, 15 kilometers, if I'm reading that uh, correctly, in terms of meters. Um, I am only going to take polarization of a, uh, a consistent polarization in all the images, so you don't see a lot of flicker in terms of the, the changes in brightness. So I'm, in this case, uh, selecting the HH uh, polarization. And then you get to define how many frames per second you want to look at. 
and then finally take that entire image collection and filter down once again by what we've been doing all along, the instrument mode, uh, whether it's ascending or descending and the polarization. And then I also have one more filter in here is making sure that all of the images are from the same relative orbit. So I'm making sure that the uh, platform that's acquiring this imagery was on the same path each time. And that will make it a little bit more visually appealing when you're looking at a uh, video like this. So once you have that collection defined, you then can build it uh, by starting with a GRD collection and then doing these filters. And then there's some, uh, the next parts down in here is like defining what viewpoint you want to build the, build the uh, movie through here, the viewpoint parameters, previewing it what's on the screen. And then finally down here at the end here is kind of the main uh, command that you uh, would use to, you, to create this uh, uh, video. It's called ui.thumbnail. So that's taking a collection that's already been um, in all the parameters that you'd use for styling it, and then it will come back with a, a, something that is printable to the console here. The, that was uh, the main, or one of the main uh, ones that I had here in terms of locations in the Earth. But if I comment out that definition for the glacier, I could do another one for Hudson Bay. So just take a little bit to come back again because it's going to construct a similarly sized, well in this case it was 30 images for the time window I was looking at. Uh, well, once again, HH polarization because we're in a northern uh, area. And then also this EW extended, uh, extended width mode is the ones that I found for there. And so this is looking at uh, one of the islands in Hudson Bay, I don't remember the name of it but showing the variation throughout do, 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 one year, pretty much. So you see both um, when it's fully ice covered and, and you can see when the ice breakup is and turns into water as well. And then finally, the last one here is a example of the recent uh, flooding that went on in the Bahamas. Let me run that one. And if I look at the overview image here to give you a little idea of like where we're looking at, it's uh, off the coast of Florida. There's the Great Bahama, Greater Bahama Island. Can't remember which one it is here. Uh, is one of the areas that had the extensive uh, flooding damage. Well, there was flooding damage all around down there. And if I come back here and, and highlight that again. So if you want to create something like this uh, and save it, there is, whoa, that's going to be hard to read. OK, let me zoom in there. <laughs> All right, so then if you want, you can save your or open your images in NewPad or save the image. I think I'll save the image. This is a little bit harder to do on a big screen than I anticipated, but we will go on the desktop. I don't know what it's going to call it, but we'll save it there. <laughs> uh, and then finally, let's see if this works. I'm going to go up and do File, open file. <laughs> this is entertaining. All right, back to the desktop. Let's get that image. I'm sure, we'll leave the site. And now we have, it basically I just opened up this uh, GIF image. If I can get it centered there. But now you can post it somewhere else. It's just a GIF file at this point. Oh, the the white that shows up there, or? Yeah, I mean, there's not like did it, did it end before the, It stops very soon. It seems like. 
Um, that could, when I ran this, uh, or when I adjusted the times, <laughs> maybe there's new data available now. But yeah, I had found that there was flooding that was happening, or you could see at least that it was getting darker on the north coast. Uh, but it, I, I can't remember off the top of my head what the latest date was in there. Uh, but anyway, I just wanted to show you that you could at least go and get uh, those GIF images by saving them if you wanted. All right, the next thing I wanted to do is do a little bit more uh, of an example of analysis with the uh, uh, Sentinel-1 data. Uh, granted, this is not gonna be too in-depth, but it's gonna uh, do a little bit more than what we've had up to this point. And I'm going to basically start looking at anomalies. So the, the basic approach of this analysis is that we have uh, Sentinel-1 data for a period of time, sort of as a baseline. And let me go find my code here so I can say exactly what the baseline is. But it uh, looks like the baseline that we're gonna use is from 2017 to the beginning of 2019, so two years of looking at all of the available uh, Sentinel-1 imagery to establish some statistics there. And as I go down here farther, uh, there's a lot of filtering in here, and there's a lot of uh, work that's trying to make sure that whatever image, current image that I'm comparing to the historical is from the same orbit path. So there's a lot of logic in here that I'm not gonna go through in detail, but that, that's why it's there, is so I make sure that my statistics for each image that I'm comparing are always from the same um, orbit path and the satellite is in the same position. But if I go down here, and do, 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 do. so there's a lot of joins, I guess, that are going on in here to join that original um, or the collection that I'm analyzing versus the baseline. And then finally, I'm going to look at an anomaly. I'm trying to think of what the threshold or remember what threshold I used in here. So I'm going to look for my percentile statistics in here. Oh, here it is. That's what I was looking for. So I have. I'm using a percentile of one. So I <laughs> have this long um, uh, history of Sentinel-1 responses, and then I'm gonna look if it's lower than the lowest 1% of that histogram basically in there. So look if it's an anomalously low, and then color whatever is anomalously low in there. And so the results here, if I zoom out a little bit here, will show for kind of a wide area of the Bahamas here that I'm still waiting a little bit for the right ones. Eh, no, they're starting to come in here. So, so in some areas, it's like it hasn't, over the last two years, there was never a time where it looked this um, dark in the, the Sentinel-1 imagery and it's consistent pattern along the shoreline. So it's probably very likely it's flooding. One thing that's hard to uh, analyze or one thing that you have to contend with with satellite images is this idea of speckle, that you will get anomalously high and low values. Uh, they just happened, you know, due to the, the uh, mathematics of, of trying to work with this uh, radar response data. And so you always want to look for things that are spatially have patterns or temporally have patterns because individual ones uh, might have a little bit of noise uh, in there. But what I could do then is uh, zoom out a little bit. What, so the, the nice thing about this uh, analysis is that it works wherever you lay down the geometry potentially right now. So I'm going to, I guess, ask for areas of the world. If anybody is curious about some <laughs> potential flooded area and they know exactly when the flood is, we could actually go there. Or if not, I have, uh, I have one other one that I, I looked up for an India flood from a few years ago. So if it's flooding right now, I might not be able to help you right. Depends on, <laughs> depends on the latency there. But um, I mean, we could try. So what is our date right now? It's the 16th. So I'm gonna just advance this for 10 days. And then the geometry, I'm gonna comment out here. And then let's go find Cambodia. And then any particular area? Yeah, 
right where my hand is. Okay, so what I'm gonna do then is uh, delete this geometry and I'll draw a new one just covering a bunch of that area here. This is where we get into the really live demo because I have no idea what's going on there and I don't know if this will work. But that's what's kind of fun about Earth Engine is that you can uh, uh, explore quite easily and try things out. All right, so let me pause here a little bit as I zoom out. Uh, so it's, once again, it's the same baseline that two years earlier, uh, these areas seem to be anomalously dark. Whether it's flooding or not, but that looks to be flood-like pattern. All righty, so any other places? I'll take one more request if we know where to go. Mozambique? Is that right? Uh, current also? What's that? Current, okay. So let's uh, delete our geometry one more time so we can redraw some. And it will just be pretty rough like this. Run that one. Zoom out a little bit. Oh, sorry, I zoomed in way too far. Towards the coast. Hopefully it will capture it. Um, if there's certain areas um, that might not be covered, you know, and, and the statistics vary widely in areas that <laughs> haven't been covered much. Um, so in order to interpret this correctly, you would really want to figure out whether your baseline is actually representative of the distribution of, of the backscatter coefficients here. So seeing things that are triggering on that 1% threshold, but I don't really know what they mean at this point without further investigation. All right, uh, so if you want to uh, try different times, different locations, uh, that link is already is in there as well. All right, so let's figure out where are good ideas to go next if you're interested in this type of uh, work. Is, whoops, sorry. Uh, there are uh, certain things that you could do with the uh, SAR data that is very similar to what you do with the optical data. So the courses that we have on classification and regression are going to be quite relevant. Uh, also, the TensorFlow ones, so that's going to be quite advanced, and, and I don't have any examples of, of trying to use TensorFlow for, for something like this. But that idea of speckle and, and have it, trying to figure out how to deal with it might actually map very well into some of the convolutional neural nets that, that, are, um, that we're teaching here as well. Uh, there's also a course on time series visualization, which might uh, be able to help you uh, both quantify how much information that you're looking at over time and whether you can start making uh, threshold determinations like I did here. Uh, there's quite a few classes that we have in different ways to build a user interface that allow a user to select things like the polarization, the ascending, descending orbits, et cetera, and build more um, uh, usable apps than, the, than just the little toy examples that I had for this session. Um, there's also a a particular course on making animations in Earth Engine, uh, the techniques behind that. Uh, like I said, it's, it's kind of nice with SAR that you don't have to clean up the clouds, but in these other ones you'll have to, I'm sure they're gonna be going over a lot more of the image collection data prep that we'd use for uh, animations. Uh, and then I'd also point you back to a lot of those uh, SAR uh, guides that I had earlier on there. They have really good examples about the different band combinations that you would want to use for a particular use case, uh, especially if you're looking at land cover classification. There's some good resources in there. Uh, and then finally, SAR is pretty new to a lot of the people in the Earth Engine community. Uh, like I said, this is the first time I'm actually teaching a course on here. So, And a lot of the 
uh, questions that have been answered so far on the developers list come from SAR experts that are not at Google, and, they, and it's really great that they are uh, such a resource that uh, people can reach out to answer, answer questions on that. Uh, but if you have particular things that you uh, come across, uh, not just questions, but actually need for enhancements when you're working with SAR data because it, it requires different tools that you might not need when you're looking at optical imagery or something like that, please follow, uh, uh, file some feature requests. You can find that there's a getting help page that's in our main documentation that tells you how to uh, report bugs, uh, put in uh, enhancement requests as well. And other than that, I guess I'll just take uh, some questions, if you have any. And I think we have a microphone that might be going around or could be going around. Nope. Okay. So I will repeat the question if I once I could hear you. So uh, is there a possibility for us to do like the detection of vertical anomalies? So if it lands up in a certain earthquake event, and I want to understand that. So what you show right now is area that is flooded as horizontal anomalies, right? And I want to understand if there is the possibility of using some of the vertical anomalies. Is there an example that you can show? Um, so I don't have an example I could show you, but I could talk a little bit about it. Uh, the main uh, technique I was using right now is just change in roughness. So it's not really that it uh, was a horizontal property, it's just that the roughness changed for some reason. Um, and like I said earlier, we don't have the ability to do interferometry that would actually look at subs subsidence directly or movement that way. Uh, that being said, if you had a landslide, I still expect that you're going to get some type of roughness change associated with that. So you still might be able to use some of this. Uh, the other things that SAR is sensitive to is changes in moisture. So if you like remove the vegetation, um, it might light up quite a bit if it <laughs> turns to be mud or something like that. I don't really know. I'm just more speculating at this point. It'd be something worth like looking at. But, but the main thing that you can see right now or work with with the GRD data set that we have in here is this idea of backscatter and roughness change. Yeah, with the, I don't see a way to do that directly with the GRD data set in there. Um, the SLC data set, which you could work with outside of Earth Engine and try to get an idea of the displacement and potentially bring the displacement image into Earth Engine. But I, can't, I, I don't have a good suggestion for how you would look at displacement right now. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Okay, so the question that was asked is how many days are, is it taking to ingest data into Earth Engine? And just one hour ago, <laughs> I was teaching that analysis in the next room. <laughs> so if you're curious about that, uh, come to the Python and Colab session that's being taught tomorrow. Um, and I'm also teaching it on Wednesday as well. Because that's one of the examples that we have in there is looking at data lat latency and how you can detect that from the information that's in our data catalog. Yep. These people do speckle filtering and methods that you would use in Google Earth Engine. I know you talked about image neighborhoods, but um, other ways to deal with speckle and so on in the period? Yeah, I am not a, an expert on that, so I can't really talk very well about that, but I know that there have been requests for filters on the developers group list and some solutions with the API we have right now and also requests for different filters that we might have uh, in there. So my guess is that we will have 
a few things that you can get by with the, uh, the functions that we wrote for optical imagery, but there's other things that we would have to build in as well in order to be very eff uh, effective at um, things like the speckle removal. Yeah. But I would, I'd encourage you to search on the Earth Engine Developers Group because I know that question's been asked in there. Yes? Ah. Okay, Ray, so right now the only large radar data set that we have in Earth Engine is the Sentinel-1. We have some derived products from Elos Pulsar. Um, we would love to get additional ones in there. It usually is um, a question of the licensing, and basically, and a data source uh, that is in the correct format. Um, and then if the licensing is straightforward, uh, in the format, something we can work with, then it's just engineering time on our side. So I would uh, suggest putting in feature requests for that particular data set. Um, if you go to the getting help page, there's a link for requesting a data set in there. And even if you see it requested before, putting your use case down uh, will just give it more weight. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't have a timeline on that because I don't know the details of, of what the current licenses are for the different uh, radar set missions. Uh, I would say no. I think it's very dependent on the land cover that you're looking at, like how much speckle is going to be there or how much noise versus the signal. Uh, so I don't have any one way. It's, it, uh, there are different ways to, to composite, like in time or in space, that work also like with the imagery, uh, sort of the optical imagery. Um, but I don't have a good sense of like, any. <laughs> I may come and ask you, though, after you experiment for a bit, and then uh, maybe I'll get a sense of it. <laughs> yep. So I, d I didn't hear, was it? To increase the, is it decrease the latency or was it a different time? Yeah. Oh, to, to label the time on there? Uh, we don't as part of the Git Thumb URL, but also if you look in the Earth Engine developer group, uh, there is somebody that, and he's here <laughs> at this conference, uh, Gena, that actually posted a way to add some labels to it. I, th I can't remember if he was doing it on the screen or it was in the export. What you could do, though, is that if you, s if you kept a list of all of the times or any other label that you would want to add to the image you c or the video, you could do post-processing uh, within there. But I don't have any good examples of exactly how you would do that. If I was just trying to do it myself, I would look into the, there's a lot of Python tools like uh, PIL and other uh, image and video manipulation tools that you could use to, to change, uh, change, change a video. But we don't have it baked into our Git thumbnail URL. Yeah, behind. Oh, sorry, what was the second part? Okay, so the questions were about the processing, and the easiest way to explain that is the Earth Engine data sets. Uh, there is the page that describes uh, Sentinel data sets in there will give a brief uh, explanation of the processing that is used, and let me see if I can make that big enough. Do, 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 do. Try to remember which tablet was in there. Oh, here it was. So it's 
So the pre-processing was done with the Sentinel-1 toolbox, and then these were the steps that were done here. Um, yeah, we don't have a lot of description in there, but if you want, I mean, we can share exactly what uh, parameters we do use in the Sentinel-1 toolbox. And once again, we've been relying on our external like uh, experts to tell us, uh, guide us in improving that over time. We've had a few versions of the Sentinel-1 dataset come out because um, the earlier versions, they were both fixing the Sentinel-1 toolbox and also we were learning how to adjust the parameters uh, appropriately. Uh, there are a few folks here at the conference that I'd be happy to point you towards that can talk in detail about uh, the Sentinel-1 processing. Excellent. So if you didn't hear that, or for the recording here, is that the Severe team that put together the uh, SAR handbook, uh, or as part of, part of that, is also working on putting together a series of Earth Engine scripts that will uh, mirror what is being described in the handbook. So that should be a great resource for the community. Uh, at this point, we are out of time and we're on to our break. So I'd like to just thank you for coming and can answer any questions throughout the, the rest of the summit while you're here. Thank you.